Episode 2, Guardian. So, we start off with a strange reaction shot from Tsukasa. It gets clarified that the place he's in was once a hideout that he used to escape from people. And I guess it doesn't exist anymore. It's a bit uncertain because the show doesn't give us much context and Maka the Cat doesn't speak. All we get are responses. This is one of the reasons that I'm going into so much detail with Sign. A lot of the conversations are very esoteric. See, the fun of Sign for me comes in interpreting the world from the conversations in context. Some would have you believe that Sign is bogged down with exposition, and that is just not true. Exposition would imply that they are constantly giving you relevant information and detail, trying to clarify their world and give us its rules and boundaries. And Sign just doesn't do that. All of the world building is implication, which is the exact opposite of how stories are written today. Well, for the most part. For example, in the next scene, Tsukasa is walking by Bear and he asks him a simple question that gives us a bit more information about the setting. Did you look at the board? That being the official forms for the world. This is one of the biggest differences between the Dot Hack series and the more contemporary VR isekai shows. The connection between players through conventional means. I mean, yeah, we see whispers between players and friends lists, but rarely, if not ever, since .hack have we ever had this level of involvement with the outside world. That is because .hack is not trying to make you feel immersed in their world. There is a clear separation between the game and reality. So next we should ask, what is the point of Bear asking Tsukasa this question? Well, he has heard a rumor that one of the Crimson Knights has fallen into a coma. Combine that with the rumor that Tsukasa cannot log out and it seems logical to ask. Also, Bear is trying to figure out if Tsukasa can even see the forums, which would be further proof to him not being able to log out. He's also worried about Tsukasa, a part of his character that we learn more about as time goes on. All these implications gives a simple question, so much more depth. Is this a good way to write a show? Mm, probably not, but it is a ballsy way to write. Moving on, we see Bear and Mimiru talking about the Crimson Knights and Tsukasa. This gives us a bit of a look into what the average player thinks of the Knights. Keep in mind, this is a game where PKing has a lot of weight to it, and the Crimson Knights try to hold players accountable even though they don't have any real power. They are volunteer cops. As I said before, role players. And the assumption is, well, this is a game. If there's a problem, admins should deal with it. Why should these jerks get to ruin my fun, or someone else's fun? On the other hand, PKers are fucking assholes, as we will soon learn, so it's also helpful to new players to have a guild who is dedicated to policing the world. So the overall opinion is, I don't mind what they're doing, but they sure can be annoying. Bear also shows his doubts about Tsukasa not being able to log out, and that's actually reasonable. I mean, let's say some jerk in WoW walks up to you and tells you, Hey, I am trapped in this video game, would you help me? Would you believe them? Probably not. Bear, however, is seeing evidence of things happening that should not happen in a game. It's only a rumor, and how much can be believed is questionable. But in a very short amount of time, two things have happened that are unbelievable. A player can't log out, and a game put a player into a coma. And all that craziness is following Tsukasa. Speaking of asshole players, we get to meet the funnest character in the show, Sora, the Twin Blade. So this guy is just the fucking best. Literally, there is only one other character in the entire show that is a match for him. He is presumably an extremely high level character and uses that to PK players just for shits and giggles. And this is actually the most realistic interpretation of a PKer that I've ever seen in anime. He's not evil or a monster or anything like that. He just sees the world as a playground, and PKing is just part of the game. And all he wants is for people to play with him. So he shakes them down not for money or items, but for their member addresses. Something else I want to talk about in the sidebar, which will become a bigger deal later, is the morality of player killing. I won't go into much detail, but as time goes on in the Dot Hack series, PKing becomes more of a social issue in the world and in real life. It has to do with the hyper-realism and immersion of VR MMOs. If stabbing someone feels just as real as stabbing someone in real life, it changes the perspective a bit. They don't give you a definitive stance anywhere in the series, but .hack does not ignore the implications of essentially a murder simulator in society. And when you learn more about Sora and who he is in real life, it makes this scene a bit more gruesome. 
fucking boats! It's a gondola, faggot. This next scene is where Subaru and the rest of the Crimson Knights are investigating what actually happened to Silver Knight. They are guarding the Chaos Gates because logic says that eventually Tsukasa will have to return to a root town, keeping in mind that they don't know that Tsukasa is stuck in the game. Subaru's main worry is how this happened, and keeping the Knights as safe as possible. It's easier to grasp how she feels about the situation when you know that she doesn't really want to be the leader of the Crimson Knights. Throughout the series, she will always maintain that they are only role-playing and that they do not have any real power and what they do is a service and not actual authority. She talks to her knights very plainly, while they treat her like a queen. These are problems for later, but when analyzing her scenes, it's good to keep that in mind. And speak of the devil, Tsukasa gates into the root town, only to see the knights and immediately leave. So they were right, and now they know he's on this server. Remember from the first episode that when you enter a field, you create an instance. So you always have to return to get to another server, or log out. Tsukasa starts to feel trapped, when Maka shows up and directs him to follow. He takes him into a dungeon, telling him of a place that he can be left alone. They are both followed by Sora, who is probably looking for an easy PK. Tsukasa walks past the Got statue and through a wall in the back, escaping Sora. And this is where we meet probably the most important entity in the series. Literally, the center conflict of the entire show. Aura, the ultimate AI. So I'm going to explain a bit about who she is, because it's basically never explained in the entire show. I plan on expanding on the finer details of this in a later, more comprehensive video, but basically understand that the world was made for the specific reason of creating Aura, the ultimate AI. As of right now, she is incomplete, but very close to finishing. The way she gathers data is by an incomplete AI program with the sole purpose of gathering data on players in the world, to encompass the human spectrum of emotion. That is who the voice in the sky actually is. I tell you this because 1. As I said before, this is not a summary, I want you to know all the context. And 2. None of this is ever told to you outright. Ever. Her name is Morgana and she wants Tsukasa to just exist close to Aura. Her reasons will be explained later, but I think we can assume that it's not good. What is good is that she gives Tsukasa a very powerful gift. He can now travel anywhere in the world without a Chaos Gate. Probably pretty useful for his predicament. Back in the server Highland Dunloriag, or Theta server, we see the gang talking amongst themselves about Tsukasa's situation and the sheer impossibility of a player getting trapped in the game. Bear turns it into a more esoteric conversation. He talks about an old game he played when he was younger. He sometimes thought about what happened to the world he was in every time he pressed the reset button. Did that world become engulfed by darkness because the game wasn't finished? In relation to Tsukasa, he's saying if the world has become real for him, then his situation might be more complicated than just a simple reset. And all this gets into the themes of identity, cyberliminality, and much, much more. And if you really want to know more about this, watch my video on dot hack and identity. Link in the description. So Tsukasa, using his newfound safety from his guardian and his unlimited means of travel, he emails Mimiru, feeling like he can talk to her now. Unfortunately for him, she brings Bear, which doesn't sit well with him. Now this is where I'm going to get a bit empathetic, and Tsukasa might not deserve it, but I can tell you that I hate it when I call my friends over and they show up with more people than I invited or expected. It's about being able to control your environment, and of the many things that Tsukasa is looking for, control over his surroundings is one of them. It's nothing really personal about Bear himself. He just showed up expecting one thing and got something different, and that agitates him a bit. All I'm saying is, I can relate. They ask him if he's seen the board again, where the Crimson Knights are looking for information about Tsukasa's whereabouts and possibly rumors about Silver Knight's coma have spread. And that's when he says what Bear and Mimiru have only suspected. He tells them he is not in front of a terminal. I like the lighting in this scene because it perfectly encapsulates the gravity of this situation. They have just confirmed something that should be impossible. Tsukasa says that the world is now his world, and he has completely abandoned the real world. He tells them about his power, and that it was given to him. They ask him, How is it possible to beat someone so bad that you can physically hurt them? Tsukasa is a bit shocked by the revelation. I'm gonna get a bit deep on this scene because it reveals more specifics about Tsukasa's feelings. 
So, he was fine with the Guardian PKing people because, fuck them, they should go away. However, he definitely doesn't want to hurt people in real life. This proves that we can't really believe everything he says about himself. His actions speak louder than his words, and if he truly believed that the world was the equivalent of the real world, then he wouldn't treat PKing so flippantly. He was still thinking about the world as a video game, and right when he learns that he actually hurt someone, he gets taken aback. Nevertheless, he retreats back into his apathy and says there's really nothing he can do about it. Unfortunately, shit's gotten too real, and Tsukasa is about to dip. They start to try and stop him when the Guardian shows up. This is where we learn that Tsukasa really doesn't have any control over who this Guardian attacks. Probably because the one who made the Guardian doesn't really care too much about other people besides Tsukasa. Morgana only needs Tsukasa alive. We'll learn later that Morgana has a good reason to not care about how many people she hurts. The first crack in Tsukasa's newfound freedom has appeared. And that's episode 2. I was able to skip a few more episodes in this one, but shit's about to get real. See me in episode 3, and if you want more, you should check out my analysis video on identity and dot hack. And you know what, if you like what I do, think about donating a buck or two to my Patreon so I can feed my cat Fancy Feast. See you in the next one.